Hey fellas, we should be live right now. I apologise about the laptop if you can hear it. For some reason, just before streams it decides to make a lot of noise. So, today we're going to be talking about something that I've been working on for quite a while. And that is about Julius Evola. So for those who want to follow along as well, I've provided a PDF in the description with the basic text of this stream. I'll probably be commentating on it as I go. But this is where I'm going to be getting the majority of my information. And, you know, it might benefit you, particularly if you are a pro Evola, to grab this and take a read. Because today we're going to be discussing his approaches to Christianity and how Christianity can interface with Evola. Because I don't think this has really been discussed all that much. The most that I have seen in relation to Evola being discussed anywhere online are people basically stating like basically overwhelming positives about him. And granted, I haven't been much active in the dissident right for quite a while. And also, people calling him kind of racist. But I think that there really hasn't been a real critique of some of the theological ideas he puts forward, at least in relation to Christianity. And so I thought it might be useful here to point out Evola's errors, not just in terms of Christianity, I think, although this is going to be the focus, but also from the point of view of natural philosophy, which everybody shares, pagans, Christians, Jews, Muslims, you have it, you know, what, what have you. And so I'm going to be reading much of this out just verbatim, and, um, yeah, if you guys want to give questions, uh, there will be splits in the stream to give those, because it's going to be a rather long stream. I've got a lot written here. So, Evola is a figure who has been in the vogue in dissident right circles for a few years. Proclaimed as the world's most right-wing thinker by Jonathan Bowden, he seems to have been regarded as one of the f most fo one of the foremost thinkers of the movement. When I was involved in the dissident right, I thought this as well. Then I actually read him. Before, I'd, I'd read um, some of his stuff on Praxis before, and it didn't really strike me, but after I, I became more ingrained in Roman Catholicism, I started to notice more of the issues. I read through Revolt Against the Modern World recently, and I encountered a growing anti-Christian... After I encountered a growing anti-Christian attitude in the dissident right, this was mainly from um, Academic Agent. He's the one who ultimately drove me to, um, to go through this process. And this stream will be responding to that book. This is going to be largely in isolation with, um, you know, a little bit of knowledge here and there, but not really all that much. I took very serious issue with much of his philosophy, not just because of my faith, but because of the sense of reality which I had learnt from the many, my many classics that I've read and from the sacred scriptures. Especially scripture and especially the theologians, so reading the early Christians and reading the scholastics was a bit inf big influence. Therefore, as I see no other serious criticisms of Evola beyond calling him racist or something, I want to take on his views. In this stream, I will present his basic historical errors in relation to the Old Testament, to the inception of Christianity and to Christian doctrine, and believe me, he hasn't done his reading. Likewise, I will take time to point out just a few of the doctrines that Evola states are traditional and to show how they're contrary to a consistent reading of scripture and divine tradition, as well as reality. He always talks about a particular idea being traditional, but I can't recall him ever talking much about ideas being true. He always talks in terms of the tradition, which comes probably some, um, to some extent out of his traditionalism, which is fideistic by nature. I'm going to split this stream into sections, regarding the Old Testament first, then the inception of Christianity, then Christian doctrine, and finally, on Evola's doctrines which are contrary to Christianity. By the way, this last one is far from exhaustive. There's a lot in Revolt Against the Modern World, and there's stuff I'll be leaving out. And I'll give gaps in these sections for questions. So, um, I can see there are a bunch of people here already. If you guys want to ask, um, ask questions, go nuts. Haven't you been in contact with Philosopher Cat? Streaming at the same time as her earlier vid premiere, lol. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I have talked to um, Philosopher Cat briefly. I was going to stream with her about, uh, I think it was sacerdotal um, ordination in Catholicism or something like that. It was about um, initiatory uh, sacraments, which is one of the things that Evola actually gets quite wrong. So, 
without further ado, we'll go into the section on the Old Testament. And to be fair, like, this is very much um, of his time, uh, his, his view of the Old Testament. So I will be using evidence that, um, that wasn't as apparent. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't really even there in the, in the literature, to my knowledge, during Evola's lifetime. But it's important, and some of it actually was. Evola's understanding of the Old Testament seems to be very much of his time, in that it is almost entirely false. His approach to the division within Israel is something which is reminiscent of outdated critical methods of scripture study, which divided up the scripture. One manifestation of this, I think, is the division he makes between the priesthood and the prophets. And so we'll first discuss the origin of the Pentateuch. He states on page 241 and 242 of Revolt, which is Revolt Against the Modern World, of course, that Judaism was originally established by a group of priests who were trying to rule over an ethnically, an, ethnic, an ethnically diverse group of people. This origin is true in two senses, although I suspect that this is contrary to Avola's meaning. Firstly, the founders of the Old Testament religion, which we'll call Israelitism, as opposed to Judaism, which is modern Judaism, is distinct were two people of the priestly tribe, that is, of Levi, Moses and Aaron. Israelitism is the revelations to Moses and the laws that originated in the Israelite trek through the wilderness. This can be affirmed as historical due to evidence of Middle Egyptian loanwords in the Pentateuch, or the first five books, in fact, to a greater extent than the rest of the books of the Old Testament. The evidence of mass Canaanite settlement at Avaris, which is actually in the land of Goshen, which uh, people who have read the book of Exodus will recall, and mentions of Israel on the Menepta stele around two, uh, one to, um, sorry, 1210 BC. Additionally, the Israelites were ethnically mixed, as the, Pe as the Pentateuch itself affirms. This is because many Egyptians fled with the Israelites into the desert. In fact, Jewish tradition affirms, I believe it's Pharaoh's mother goes, um, goes with the Israelites. And I believe it's the Book of Numbers. It's either Numbers or Deuteronomy speaks of an Egyptian child cursing God. And because of the distinctions between the tribes of Israel themselves. Like, there are there are the 12 tribes of Israel, and they do have some distinction. I'm not sure I go as far as, um, you know, ethnic diversity that we have nowadays. But there is, of course, distinctions between Naphtali and Judah, for example. However, of course, the Christian cannot agree that this was simply sacerdotal rule uh, throughout all of Israel's history. If this were the case, then Moses wouldn't have written laws for kings in Deuteronomy. There, there must have been some acknowledgement of the temporal sword, which was probably written between 1400 BC and 1200 BC due to its unique similarities with Hittite legal codes found exclusively in this time period, as the evangelical orientalist Kenneth Kitchen notes. We also cannot agree that, with where he takes this, as he wants to assert that the Jewish rebelliousness that he acknowledges, originates in this, in this ethnic diversity. Of course, anybody on the dissident right has heard, um, has heard this a million times before, millions of times over and over again. However, as Avola speaks of a specifically Jewish spirit of rebellion, he has to explain how this can apply to the Jews of the modern era, who are so ethnically set apart that it can sometimes cause congenital defects. The Jews are a distinct ethnic group, and we can tell this from their genetic profile. He says in the book that this somehow persisted for 2,000 years, but you would think, especially considering how ethnically focused Jews are, that you would see uh, this rebelliousness that he claims is there. Like, you wouldn't see that in, in his time, because they became ethnically distinct in that period. There must have been a time where there was a, ethnic, there was a healthy ethnic unity in Jewish groups, and yet he poses rebellion as a specifically Jewish quality. The answer to this question, that is, the Jewish rebelliousness, however, is evident across the whole Old Testament. From the very moment that the Israelites enter Canaan, they fall into idolatry because of the other nations around them. This happens throughout history, to the point where Ezra considers this to be such a problem that he tells the Jews to forsake their wives among the Gentiles. The idolatry of the surrounding nations was the cause of stumbling among the Israelites. Although they worshipped the highest thing in existence, that pure being from which all existence originates, they still chose to worship created things. They chose lesser things, not rendering to the one who created them the proper due respect and worship and obedience, as Evola would expect somebody to do to a king. Therefore, God drove them out for doing this, and the, resu and 
the results of such a moral failing. So, of course, uh, there's reports in the Jewish traditions. I think it was um, one of the kings tried to burn, uh, like, you know, tried to burn the his son to uh, probably Molech or one of these demon gods. There were a lot of um, disordered practices in the area, to put it mildly. And if you dig into Canaanite history, even before the exile, to, uh, even before the um, exodus, to my understanding, you will find some pretty grisly stuff. They behaved contrary to the natural law, and worship of the one God is of the natural law. This isn't something that simply pertains to a particular covenant on Sinai or wherever. The knowledge of God is in man's heart. However, Evola adds an additional element to this, wherein he poses the prophets against these priests. He places this predominantly in the mouth of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Never mind the fact that Isaiah was probably a priest himself and Jeremiah was born in one of the Levitical cities that Joshua set aside for the priestly caste. He probably gets this idea from reading Isaiah 1, wherein it says that the feasts and animal sacrifices of Israel are not sufficient for him. However, as we see later on in his book, in Isaiah 58, that same God reproaches their fasting, which is a similar discipline on account of their improper behaviour. Additionally, if, his, if Isaiah had meant to rebel against the prescriptions of the law, even in ceremonial aspects, then how is it that the post-exilic Jews still added ceremonies such as Purim, as we have noted in Esther? As we have seen in Esther. Sorry. This entire case rests on a gigantic assumption, and, and that, there were, that there was a human... Uh, sorry, me reading and that, that there was a hermeneutic of discontinuity among the exiles to Babylon, when this couldn't have been the case. There were men who survived the entire breadth of the exile, even returning to see the temple rebuilt under Zerubbabel. This same group also included Daniel, who was familiar with Jeremiah, as we see in Daniel chapter 9. How could they have forgotten this? Indeed, this forgetfulness would have, been, would have, would have to be so deep as to deceive Zechariah, one of the minor prophets, into saying that all nations shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles, which these priests established. This guy was also post-exilic. He was one of the final prophets, if not the final prophet, Zechariah. Surely Zechariah would have known of this if there were some sort of struggle. There is also a massive flaw in one of his footnotes, which asserts that these prophets were also utterly entranced when they were prophesying. This doesn't make much sense because God also creates the nature of the man, including the rational far the faculties of that man. God calls these good, as we see in Genesis 1, so why would he utterly override the rationality of these people? Why would he produce a stumbling block in the form of a madman jittering? Would this not be contrary to the order of nature? Which, which the supernatural aspect cooperates with, coming from the same source. So how can this be the case? Our catechism, the Roman Catholic catechism, goes as far as to assert that there was human cooperation with the divine in the production of all scripture, including the prophets, even the late ones who would be deep in the prophetism that Evola labels it, as Evola labels it, such as Zechariah. So these notes, I, I should have probably given them more grammar checks, before I um, I printed them out, but Evola poses this this sort of discontinuity in the Jewish religion, and he places the prophets against the priests rather than as two cooperating forces, and sometimes even intersecting with each other. So Ezekiel, I believe, is a priest. Jeremiah is born in a Levitical city. You have Isaiah, who is probably a priest likewise. It doesn't make sense of the scriptural data to make this particular point. So, uh, there are there are questions here. Um, by the way, this is going to be one of the sections where, um, if people want to ask questions, uh, you can do that now. Okay, please share it, of course. Actually, no, I've, I've forgotten. I left a little bit because Evola makes this very interesting point. He says that he believes that the idea of the Messiah is cope. He believes that basically Israel was being defeated so they, they came up with this idea of a saving military god and then this sort of devolved into weird stuff. That's basically his view. The same Zechariah that I just mentioned also proclaims the coming of the Messiah in his book, which is another point that Evola is contentious on. 
He asserts that the Messiah was initially invented, and again he cites Isaiah and Jeremiah for this idea of a military Messiah, which then degenerated into an idea of a Messiah bringing the end of the world, who would redeem Israel. Now, setting aside that this propitiatory Messiah is mentioned in Isaiah 53, we ought to look for other sources to back this up, this idea of the Messiah. Job, which is a book where dating is extraordinarily loose, so there are people who hold it's earlier than the um, the Pentateuch. There are people who hold that it's like post-exilic, I think. The general consensus is like 6th century, but what does the consensus know? The consensus of biblical scholars is not a reliable thing. Job, which is a book, as I said, states that Job will see his Redeemer with his own eyes. Now, God is the Redeemer of Israel, as we see in Isaiah, which therefore means that there would be an incarnation of God. Additionally, we see in the Hebrew version of the book of Numbers, in chapter 24, verses uh, 1 through 19 I've written. I'm not sure if this is specifically it, but I'll read it anyway. Then Balak's anger burned against Balaam. So the context is, is that Israel is coming out of the is coming out of the wilderness and they come across the um, the Midianites I believe and their king Balak contacts a prophet and you know seer called Balaam to curse Israel and there are four sequences of curses and this is at the end of the th of the third curse then Balak's anger burned against Balaam because what Balaam does is he repeatedly blesses because he can't curse then Balak's anger burned against Balaam and he struck his hands together, and Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have persisted in blessing them these three times, so flee to your place now. I said I would honour you greatly, but behold, the Lord has, sent you, has held you back from honour. And Balaam said to Balak, Did I not in fact tell your messengers whom you had sent to me, saying, If Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything contrary to the command of the Lord either good or bad, of my own accord, or of my own accord, that should be. What the Lord speaks, I will speak. So now, behold, I am going to my people. Come, and I will advise you of what this people will do to your people in the days to come. This in the Hebrew translates literally to the end of days. Then he took up his discourse and said, The declaration of Balaam, the son of Baal, and the declaration of the man whose eyes eye is opened, the declaration of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down yet having his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I look at him, but not near. A star shall appear from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall smash the forehead of Moab and overcome all the sons of, of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession. Sire, its enemies, also will be a possession while Israel performs valiantly. One from Jacob shall rule, and will eliminate the survivors of the city. Now this is this being from the Pentateuch comes from between 1400 and 1200 BC, according to Kenneth Kitchen. This is a full 500 years before Evola states, because Evola says that this idea of the Messiah was invented in the 7th and 6th century, but this is just not true. This is also read continually during the post-exilic period too. The, of course, the Israelites don't forsake the old books, they keep the law. In fact, one group of them, the Sadducees, only holds the books of the law to be actual scripture. So the idea that Judaism somehow lost contact with this military messiah in itself is absurd. They even used to pray the Psalms that proclaimed the messiah, military messiah each and every day, including Psalms which portray the father and type of the messiah, David, as suffering grievously. The very nature of the Jewish tradition, especially post-exile, means that the expectations couldn't have degenerated, especially considering the same law which the priests wrote. In Deuteronomy, provides specific guidelines on how to vet prophets to make sure they're not frauds. So you have these laws where it says if they preach contrary to God, they're stoned. And they need miracles, like actual manifest exterior miracles to affirm them. The reason why this test is invoked, I believe, is because God is the only source of miracles. Because God is pure being, the only way that a miracle can occur, that is something contrary to nature, is if God permits it to happen, or actively wills it to happen, as a means of affirming the prophet. So, simply being a madman is not going to provide any sort of credibility under the system. There has to be 
manifest supernatural action on behalf of the prophet to affirm what the prophet is actually saying. Uh, Applied Virtue says, I've seen some Christians repeat Evola's point above, prophets versus priests. It seems like it's based on... I don't think it would be Protestantism's denial of the sacerdotal order. I don't, I don't think that would be true, because a lot of Protestants will have their own ordinations. Okay. And then we get into his views on early Christianity, which spring from this prophetism. Evola asserts that this prophetism, as he calls it, was where Christianity emerged. He portrays it, rather illiterately, as this overly emotional cult of maniacs, who had this feeling, unquote, of grace by which they're safe. We will cover his doctrinal errors in a bit, but I want to note some things quickly. Evola was not a stupid man. He knew that emotions were something of the body more than the non-physical aspects of man. The passions emerge from our physicality. Evola then proceeds to assert that this overly emotivistic cult also maniacally ran to their deaths at the hands of the Romans. This could not be further from the truth. Further all, First of all, as emotions are of the body, how can it be that an emotivistic cult could set aside those feelings in order to die in utterly brutal ways? It doesn't make sense. If someone is so bodily as to allow his emotions to dominate him, surely the provocation of things against that body is going to frighten him. The only way that martyrdom of any form can occur is with a great degree of self-control, which is the subordination of feelings. It makes no sense. Additionally, a brief reading of the early martyrdom accounts can put this idea that they're raving lunatics to sleep pretty quick. To demonstrate this, we're going to look at an early account of a martyr, who is also my patron saint and a Greek philosopher, an apologist called Saint Justin Martyr. We're going to read the whole thing because it's very short. If those those of you who want to read along, I'm going to link it. There we go. In the time of the lawless partisans of idolatry, wicked decrees were passed against the godly Christians in town and country to force them to offer libations to vain idols. And according to, accordingly, the holy man, that's Justin, having been apprehended, ha- holy men even, having been apprehended, were brought before the prefect of Rome, Rusticus by name. Uh, interesting note, uh, Rusticus actually personally knew Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor at the time. Actually, it might have been um, Antonius Pius at this point. Yeah, I I think it was Rusticus anyway. And when they had been brought before his judgment seat, he said to Justin, Obey the gods at once and submit to the kings. Justin replied, To obey the commandments of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, is worthy of neither of blame nor of condemnation. Rusticus the prefect said, What kind of doctrines do you profess? Justin said, I have endeavoured to learn all doctrines, but I have acquiesced at last in the true doctrines, those namely of the Christians, even though they do not please those who hold false opinions. Rusticus the prefect said, Are those the doctrines that please you, you utterly wretched man? Justin said, Yes, since I adhere to them with right dogma. Rusticus the prefect said, What is the dogma? Justin said, that according to which we worship the the God of the Christians, whom we reckon to be one from the beginning, the maker and fashioner of the whole creation, visible and invisible, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had been also been preached beforehand by the prophets as about to be present with the race of men, the herald of salvation and teacher of good disciples. And I, being a man, think that what I can say is insignificant in comparison with his boundless divinity, acknowledging a certain prophetic power, since it was prophesied concerning him, of whom now I say, that he is the Son of God. For I know that of old the prophets foretold his appearance among men. I'm going to quickly check the the chat, see if there are any questions. No. Okay. Rusticus the prefect said, Where do you assemble? Justin said, Where each one chooses and can. For do you fancy that we all meet in the very same place? Not so, because the God of the Christians is not circumscribed by place, but being invisible, fills heaven and earth, and everywhere is worshipped and glorified by the faithful. Rusticus the prefect said, 
Tell me where you assemble, or into what place do you collect your followers? Justin said, I am. I live above one Martinus, at the Timothean bath, or the Timiotian, Timiotian bath even, and during the whole time, and I am now living in Rome for the second time, I am un unaware of any other meeting than this. And if any one wished to come to me, I communicated to him the doctrines of truth. Rusticus said, Are you not, then, a Christian? Justin said, Yes, I am a Christian. Then said the prefect Rusticus to Chariton, Tell me further, Chariton, are you also a Christian? Chariton said, I am a Christian by the command of God. Rusticus the prefect asked the woman, Charito, What say you, Charito? Charito said, I am a Christian by the grace of God. Rusticus said to Euipistus, and what are you? You, a Uelpistus, even, sorry, Uelpistus, a servant of Caesar, answered, I too am a Christian, having been freed by Christ, and by the grace of Christ I partake of the same hope. Rusticus the prefect said to Hyrax, And you, are you a Christian? Hyrax said, Yes, I am a Christian, for I revere and worship the same God. Rusticus the prefect said, Did Justin make you Christians? Hyrax said, I was a Christian, and will be a Christian. And Pion stood up and said, I too am a Christian. Rusticus the prefect said, Who taught you? Pion said, From our parents we received this good confession. Uel Pistus said, I willingly heard the words of Justin, but from my parents I also learned to be a Christian. Rusticus the prefect said, Where are your parents? Uel Pistus said, In Cappadocia. Rusticus said to Hyrax, Where are your parents? And he answered and said, Christ is our true father, and faith in him is our mother, and my earthly parents died, and I, when I was driven from Iconium to in Phrygia, came here. Rusticus the prefect said to Li Liberianus, And what say you, are you a Christian, and I'm willing to worship the gods? Liberianus said, I too am a Christian, for I worship and reverence the only true God. Now note how, how utterly... How utterly forward these people are! If they were very emotion, can't you ima very emotional? Can't you imagine these people being a lot more um, fidgety? Can you imagine? Can't you imagine they might decide to curse uh, Rusticus? But no, they they don't. They they're very straightforward and simple. The prefect says to Justin, "Hearken, you who are called learned, and think that you know true doctrines." If you are scourged and beheaded, do you believe you will ascend into heaven? Justin said, I hope that if I endure these things, I shall have get his gifts. For I know that to all who have thus lived, there abides the divine favour until the completion of the whole world. Rusticus the prefect said, Do you suppose then that you will ascend into heaven and receive some recompense? Justin said, I do not suppose it, but I know it. I know and I'm fully persuaded of it. Rusticus the prefect said, Let us then now come to the matter in hand, and which presses, having, having come together, offer sacrifice with one accord to the gods. Justin said, No right-thinking person falls away from piety to impiety. Rusticus the prefect said, One second. Sorry about that. Okay, where were we? Rusticus the prefect said, Do you suppose then that you will ascend into heaven? Okay, there we go, right. Rusticus the prefect said, Unless you obey, you shall be mercilessly punished. Justin said, Through prayer we can be saved on account of our Lord Jesus Christ, even when we have been punished, because this shall become to us salvation and confidence at the, most, at the more fearful and universal judgment seat of our Lord and Saviour. 
Thus also said the other martyrs, Do what you will, for we are Christians, and do not sacrifice to idols. Rusticus the prefect pronounced sentence, saying, Let those who have refused to sacrifice to the gods and to yield to the command of the emperor be scourged, and led away to suffer the punishment of decapitation according to the laws. The holy martyrs, having glorified God and having gone forth to the accustomed place, were beheaded and perfected their testimony in the confession of the Saviour. And some of the faithful, having secretly removed their bodies, laid them in a suitable place. Place, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ having wrought among along, having wrought along with them, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. So, as we can see from this. If these people were overly emotional, if they were controlled by their emotions, don't you think they might react in a slightly different way? How is it that people who supposedly have no mastery over their own emotions are able to sit there very quietly and accept excruciating punishment and death? It doesn't make sense for Evola to say this. Additionally, the Christian religion is founded on joy and calm, as we can see from the scriptures, and not on the swirling of emotions. Any reading of any spiritual book of the Catholic or Eastern Orthodox tradition will tell you that. The main descriptor of growth in the spiritual life, which are the purgative, illuminative, and unitive ways, go back to the 3rd century, these being actions of divine grace and our cooperation with it. And much of our monasticism and hermetic, her, um, hermetic, not hermetic, hermetic, like of the hermits, Practice is found in the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. Never once do they ever encourage a mindless emotivism, which is what Evola claims us to be. Okay. What I meant by that is that a lot of Protestants contrast the sacrificial nature of the Old Testament, Judaism, and Christianity, in which minds reject. Oh, okay. So it's a denial of the um, sacerdotal no nature of. Um, well, the priesthood. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a bit of a silly thing. And so this actually provides us a good segue, because now we're going to talk about his attitudes towards Christian doctrine, because they are similarly not very good. The utter misapprehension of Christian and Jewish history may be part of the reason why he is so utterly weak on this. But one also wonders if Avola had ever made a serious attempt to read the scriptures or early Christian history at all, or the fathers although he is aware of at least some of them. First of all, Evola believes, as he states on 200, page 288 of Revolt, that Catholicism developed out of Christi primitive Christianity in a way which he describes as implying an ordered rupture from the original tradition. He says that Catholicism is more ordered insofar as it's more close to the pagan ideals that he holds. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. As we shall we see in the manifestation of the teaching office, which characterizes Catholicism, the papacy, as manifest in St. Peter in Scripture. Not only is he told at the end of John 21 that he is to feed his sheep, that's all of them, in distinction from any other apostle. He also has the power over life and death in Acts 5. He changes discipline and interprets his own vision, his own visions, his own vision on the fly in his meeting with Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11, and says that by his mouth, and his his he specifies his in the singular, that the Gentiles should hear the gospel in Acts 15. And this is in front of other apostles such as James. The meeting with Cornelius is even more interesting considering that St. Peter states in his second letter that scripture is not a matter of private interpretation, and yet in his own right can, he can suspend the ceremonial law even when it hasn't been formally made binding, unbinding in, by council. So he he allowed, you know, he, he makes allowances without necessarily consulting a council. We see also this, we see this also in the Fathers as well. For example, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who is writing at the beginning of the second century, around about five to ten years, more like five years after the death of the last apostle, he writes in his epistle to the Romans, he where he says that the See of Rome, which is established by St. Peter, and also is where St. Paul is martyred. I don't know if Paul... Actually, I don't know if it's both Paul and Peter that, that combine it, but in any case, it's established. That He says that this see presides over charity, which in light of John 21, seems to affirm the feeding of the sheep. For Christ tells St. Peter to feed his sheep in response to Christ questioning, questioning him about his love for him. 
On top of this, we see the likes of Irenaeus in chapter 3 of Book 3 of Against Heresy stating that all churches are churches only if they agree with Rome, by virtue of the apostles St. Peter and St. Paul. Likewise, St. Augustine proclaims Rome as the sea which cannot fail in numerous places. In fact, the sheer number of patristic witnesses to the, patri uh, the papacy is too many to proclaim here. So I'll simply redirect everybody with an interest in this to reason and theology, which is a channel which has hours and hours of content on this. And so we see that the very teaching office of the, of the Roman Catholic Church has its beginning in the gospel itself as being that which cannot be prevailed over. So to say that it somehow like broke from primitive Christianity in this kind of hermeneutic of discontinuity is simply not true. As if stating the rupture which led to Catholicism wasn't enough, Evola denies that Christianity is an initia initiational religion. He, he believes literally that there is no initiatory aspect to Christianity at all. One struggles to believe that Evola had even opened a Bible when he asserted this. However, I do know that Evola published papers for a Baptist journal, and so this may be where this comes from. Because for almost everybody, baptism is an initiatory sac sacrament, alongside confirmation for apostolic churches. I think also the Anglicans hold it. We would hold, with basically everybody before the 17th century, that baptism regenerates, and is not merely a sign of faith. In the words of the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 47 of his book, then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house towards toward the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under, and from the right side of the house, from south of the altar. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate, and led me around on the outside of the outer, to the outer gate, by the way facing east. And behold, water was spurting out from the south side. When the man went to, out toward the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits, and he led me through the water, water reaching the ankles. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the knees. Again he, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the hips. Again he, reached, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not wade across, because the water had risen enough enough water to swim in, a river that could not be crossed by wading. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen that? Have you seen this? Then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, on the bank of the river there were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then he said to me, These waters go out toward the eastern, eastern region and go down into the Arabah. Then they go toward the sea, being made to flow into the sea, and the waters of the sea become fresh. And it will come about that every living creature which swims, which which sw swarms, oh, which swarms in in every place where the river goes will live, and there will be very many fish, for these waters go there and the others become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. And it will come about that fishermen will stand beside it. From Engadi to Engalame, there will be a place for the spreading of nets. Their fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the great sea, very many. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. And by the river on its bank, on, the, on one side and on the other, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not, not wither, and their fruit will not fail. Remember Psalm 1. They will bear fruit every month because of their water because of the, their water flows from the sanctuary. And their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. This, to me, sounds a lot like baptismal regeneration, which is one of the, one of the early Christian doctrines and the doctrines that the Catholic Church and many other churches hold. Henceforth, we can see, because it gives life, it opens us up to God, that the ba that baptism has an initiatory character. And so likewise does confirmation, as we will see from the book of Acts. Let's see if there are any questions here. 
Okay. I don't see any questions. By the way, guys, um, if you want to add questions, uh, I'm about, you know, I'm going to start, pa I'm going to pause at um, reasonable intervals so people, you know, can ask questions about whatever, and I'll answer them as we, as we go by. Okay. One second. I think I might have stapled the wrong page. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I think I printed the wrong the wrong version. I'll just open up the uh, the new version because there were some mistakes in the version that I printed out. So I'm just gonna grab the better one. Okay. He also thinks that under the incarnation of Christ, that God ceases to be pure being. So as we understand from Christianity, uh, the God. Uh, that controls and makes the universe is pure being, meaning that he is without defect, he is without matter, he is without any kind of causation, he is eternal and he is indivisible, and he is personal. And he, he also thinks under the incarnation that God ceases to be this and becomes entirely a man. He doesn't state this explicitly, but the way that he words a particular passage, it's exactly what he means, because there's no way that he could pose God being like a symbol of an essence, I think the word he says, and then God becoming a man, although I'm not entirely sure what he means by symbol of an essence. I suspect he means something related to what I just said. But the fact that he states that God becomes a man and has a, quote, passion, implies to me very strongly that he thinks that in Christianity, God is this, you know, emotional human being. Which, in, in the incarnation is true as pertains to the human nature, but the divine nature is not touched. This is heresy is a strange inverse monophysitism, in that Evola is stating that God's nature has changed to become one nature as human. Monophysitism was condemned formally in the 5th century, and its inverse is even more strange, which we receive from Evola. Not even the most extreme Arian would hold to this position. However, even before this, the problem of God becoming passable was a non-starter. Among the early heresies of Christianity, the only one which I know of which comes even close to this were the Ebionites, and they didn't believe Jesus was God. The other heretics tended to believe that Jesus was a spiritual being, more than being human. Saint Irenaeus, writing at the close of the 2nd century, even asserts against, against them proclaiming that they disbelieve in the union of God and man. In book 5... Uh, sorry, I, I should have really corrected that. He's talking about the Ebionites here. So he even asserts against them that they that they disbelieve in the union of God and man in Book 5, Chapter 1 of Against Heresies, while he affirms the absolute perfection of God. The mere fact that this same doctor, with the entirety of Christianity, proclaims that Jesus can grant eternal life is, in fact, implicitly affirming the utter incor in utterly incor utter incorruptibility and impassibility of the divine person of Christ. Such is implied by St. Irenaeus again when he states, For what honour can those things which are temporal confer on such as are eternal and endure forever, or those which pass away on such as remain? or those which are corruptible on such as are incorruptible. For his juxtaposition asserts that eternal life belongs to the incorruptible, and hence to the divine nature. St. Justin Martyr, writing a few decades before, also describes this same divine nature as without impurity, and states in his first apology, quote, For they who affirm that the Son is the Father are proved neither to have become acquainted with the Father, nor to know that the Father of the universe has a Son, who also, being the first begotten word of God, is even God. Therefore, to assert that the early Christians, or any real, well, I don't know about modern Christians, but to speak of early Christianity, and certainly of Orthodox Christianity, as holding God as anything but incorruptible and impassable in his divine nature, this is absurd. Christ is only, is only passable in his incarnation. He also states another absurdity in relation to the same Son, in that he believes that the Son is somehow placed above the Father in Christianity. This is absurd because even in early Christianity, when Christology hadn't been pronounced on, uh, pronounced on properly, 
If anything, the issues predominantly focused on denigrating the nature of the sun. Arianism made the sun into a creature, and hence lower than God, and Sabellianism made the sun into a mere aspect of the one God, with the Father and the Spirit. To assert that the sun was too highly revered in early Christianity, outside of bizarre Gnostic movements who thought that the Father, by virtue of the Old Testament, was evil, is ridiculous. This preeminence of the sun doesn't ex doesn't really exist. In fact, the son proceeds from the father. Now, it may happen that we address Jesus more in our prayers than we do the father, but Jesus is of one essence with the father. So we are addressing the same God. So we're not denigrating the father or denigrating the Holy Spirit by praying to Jesus because he is of the same essence as the father and the spirit. In the same vein, he makes the mistake of suggesting that the synoptic gospels play down Our Lady's role and even goes as far as to compare her to a fertility goddess, citing St. Jerome in a footnote. Now, to state that Mary is underplayed because of the volume of the text on her in Luke is ridiculous. The multitude of words on a particular thing don't denigrate the importance of that thing. So, you could have few words on something, and they could be very important, or you could have many words and it'd be utterly unimportant. Maybe not in the context of scripture, but in general. Especially someone like Mary, whose role is enunciated by reading the text of the scripture in light of her. For instance, her queenhood of heaven is made manifest by reading the Old Testament, wherein the queen of Israel was also the king's mother, as the king had multiple wives. Her queenhood of the angels is manifested in how the archangel Gabriel, who is by nature superior to Our Lady, nonetheless hails her, indicating her superiority in rank, while others tremble in fear before the archangels, as we see in Tobit with Raphael and Zechariah with the same Gabriel earlier on in Luke. In neither of these accounts does the angel state such words as Hail Mary. For such was the grace that Our Lady received from God. But to Avola, this grace is simply a feeling. To which I ask him, if Christians view grace as simply a feeling, how can it be that an archangel who is great and who is a great and incorruptible spirit, how is it that he bows before a human nature imbued with that grace? Which, otherwise, simply being of her own nature, is much, much inferior to him. How is it that the, poss that the passable emotion can cause the impassable spirit to bow? The answer is pretty simple. It doesn't. Finally, a mistake that Evola makes with Christianity, a final mistake before we get into his actual doctrines, uh, beyond Christianity and how they're problematic from a Christian point of view. Seemingly as a result of this concern for grace and for the incorruptible king of the universe, Evola complains of a desacralization of nature. Now, I don't know how anybody can read Genesis 1 and not consider nature to be good. The fact that Christ took flesh should tell us that nature is good. So to say that we hate nature is silly. If anything, with Evola, with his desire to escape the realm of becoming, and all that is merely human, is more apt to despise nature. If, as he says, an ordinary man is merely doomed to a second death, and is unable to abide in the realm of being, uh, he has this weird doctrine where there are two tiers of people, and ordinary human beings die, and then their souls kind of fade away. And then there's a second tier which, um, which has eternity, but we'll, we'll explain that in a bit. Then how, in light of this, if he thinks this of human beings, then how can it be that animals and plants and mountains and the sky can abide being completely, being completely physical in their nature? We believe that the world is reconciled in Christ, and God positively willed the world as good, although not worthy of the worship due to God. Yet Evola, if he were consistent, wouldn't make this criticism, as it seems to me that he has to have a stronger dislike of nature than we do. So it seems to me that he's very wrong. So, before we get into Evolan doctrines which are contrary to Christianity, let's have a look at the stream questions. Okay. Wow, 43 people. Um, okay. Why do you think that Evola gets so much wrong when he is himself a nat uh, native of Italy? I think it's probably because he just didn't do the legwork. He, he just didn't read. 
if he'd read Irenaeus, if he'd read St. Justin Martyr, if he'd read St. Ignatius of Antioch. In fact, he, he thinks that, like, everyone is just, like, there's this kind of level playing field in Christianity where everyone, like, there's no ranks or anything. The equality in, in, in Christianity is one of nature and not of actual rank. You, you'll see if you read the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch that there's a very strong insistence on obeying your bishop. And he speaks of a threefold distinction in the ranks of the priests. He will speak of deacons and of priests, and he will speak of bishops. There is hierarchy in Christianity, and, you know, reading St. Paul will tell you that you're supposed to obey them. But, like, we're, like Christianity is not this force that seeks to overthrow, uh, you know, like, temporal orders. That's That's ridiculous. The only way that you could even pose this would be if the nature of the government were to be to do something contrary to natural law. And even then... Okay, so, anti-clerical ideologues are insane. I, I mean, I don't think he was insane. I, I think he just didn't do his reading. If he'd read the scriptures and read all of these philosophers he would have noticed this very easily. Like, I don't think Evola was a stupid person. I think that he was somebody who could have read these people, but decided not to, as we can see from his cartoonish portrayal of Christianity. I thought he was answering questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of storing them up, and I'm going through them, and, you know, I'm going through sections. Okay. Since Jesus is equal to the Father in... Okay, to God in the... the, the okay. Here from AA, I hope you make interesting points. We've um we've been a while. <laughs> okay, so I typed out the script today, and I didn't really go for it for through it much for uh gr for grammar. So there are little uh, hiccups here and there, but I'm I'm hoping that you know, like what I'm saying here is making sense. And if people want to ask questions, like the main reason I'm doing this actually is to kind of first of all convince people that Evola is wrong on Christianity first and foremost, and second of all to sort of begin a dialogue with pagans. And to begin a dialogue with secular people who have this misapprehension of Christianity. So that there can be a mutual understanding. Because I think that there has been, up to this point, a lack of it. A lack of belief in the heroic nature of Christianity, for example. I made a video to AA, and I believe Sargon was on the stream uh, on this. If you guys want to watch that, that's on the channel as well. And of course today we're just going through Evola uh, in his philosophy. In fact, that's what we're going to go into in a second. AA sent us. Okay. How do you respond to the pagan claim that leftism was created by Christianity? Well, I, I think that since Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the 380s AD, and leftism really emerges... If we take the na simply the name leftism, it emerges it at the end of the 18th century. Of course, there are people like Voltaire and uh, Montesquieu and people like that prior. Uh, I don't think this really makes sense. Don't you think... Maybe if a ideology had such a latent seed of uh, rebellion against natural order in it, don't you think it would manifest earlier on? I mean, it was 1,400 years. 1,500, actually. 1,400, 1,500 years before this fully manifest in the chaos of the French Revolution. So I don't believe this is true. I think the mere respect for the natural law shown in people like St. Paul, if you read... Uh, the book, the epistle to the Romans, one of the first things he talks about is respect for natural law. And in that same epistle, I think it's that same epistle, in any case, in the Pauline Corpus, he talks about respect of authority as well. And the mere fact that this exists in the Pauline Corpus uh, should tell you that, that Christianity doesn't reproach proper order. In fact, it establishes it. So, in fact, this is actually one of the things that Evola dislikes. Because Christianity has this view of spiritual and temporal order as distinct, and the spiritual order having precedence over the temporal order. He'll quote from Gelasius I, who speaks about how a priest uh, cannot be a king at the same time. And to be honest, reading it, it seems to me like discipline. So there's no reason why an ordained priest ontologically, like as in his object, couldn't be a king. But I think it would be extremely impractical. Um, but the, this whole idea of the co cooperation between government and the spiritual power 
uh, you know, this is this is something that has always been there. So there's no disagreement per se with kings or republics and such. But Evola takes issue with this because he believes that the seats of the spiritual power should belong to the temporal, and this is because he doesn't believe in Jesus. He believes that the bridge between the divine and the human, the merely human, is the king. But you could, of course, bring up very serious issues with this, like this manifestly causing real problems, like it not being true. So, like, for example, how can you have all of these different kings of all of these different states who have vastly contrary ideologies conveying people up to the same power? How is it that God or the divine power would permit error? As something that, by his nature, is without error. That is, not lacking in anything, because God is purely actual. I don't believe in Evola's view on this, precisely for that reason. There has to be one singular doctrine, because there is one singular ultimate reality. Not meek and mild, it means potentially dangerous by but choosing self-control instead. Well, being meek and mild, it, it doesn't mean pathetic it means being controlled and being humble okay i'm very convinced of evola personally okay uh let's see if there are any final questions before i get on to his own doctrines which are outside of christianity to be fair evola seems to have read everything except the church fathers i mean he cites the church fathers in his doctrine in his documents uh, sorry in his documents in revolt like he does footnotes but i don't think he really understands them and, like, I, I mean, I could go on about Vola, but, like, to be honest, he's not a very good, um, he's not a very good scholar. Because he doesn't cite his sources very well. He's often not very clear. Like, as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to be stating a truth, you should make it as clear as possible. Like, for example, in the beginning of the book, on page three or four, let me find it. Because he's, he's, I th it might be the translator. Right, he states he states about he state he, oh, sorry he talks about two realms. He talks about the realm of being and the world of becoming, and he speaks about the lower forms being in the world of becoming that that world of change. And he says this: by definition, that which is, which is being, has nothing to do with human and temporal affairs or situations. As in the saying, the race of men is one thing, and the race of gods is quite another. Now, when I read this, I. I thought that Evola was stating what is known as an equivocity between being and becoming. That is that they have nothing in common in a literal sense. Which would lead to really serious problems with Evola's entire system because it's basically reliant on, on initiation. So you couldn't have things like the anointing of kings, you couldn't have baptism, you couldn't have ordination if there was an equivocation between the world of being and becoming. So Evola would fall on that. Now, I was going to originally do a stream about Evola on the topic of philosophy first, but I decided that I probably need to do more reading on this, and I'm not sure I will. Um, we're going to go a little bit into the philosophical errors in a second. But I read that as him saying that there was a complete equivocity between being and becoming. But a friend of mine corrected me and said, no, he's probably just being very um, poetic. And this is a guy who, who reads a lot of philosophy and he knows how to tease out stuff like this. So that would be a very, what is known as a very weak analogy, which is like there's a similitude between them, which could work, right? Because if you hold a complete equivocity, I mean, that destroys, re it destroys Evola's worldview. And to be honest, I think it destroys a sane worldview. So like that's, that's one example. Like he's not always the most clear writer. He's not somebody who cites his sources very well. Like, Going through, if you guys missed it, um, at the beginning of the stream, I was talking about his Old Testament studies, and I had to kind of guess at where he was getting his stuff from, um, and responded to those. Uh, but if he just simply prov provided a bibliography at the back of Revolt Against the Modern World, which I don't think he does, uh, this would have made the whole process a lot easier. But he doesn't. Truth should be stated very simply. Uh, some Catholics use verses as proof texts for things like mass immigration. Well, I mean, you shouldn't use proof texts like this. 
I'm I am bad, a sinner. There is no one that's good. And turn the other cheek. Um, okay, Tony. Good for you. It's a hyper empathy and self hatred problem. Well, okay, Tony. If if Catholics were so self hating, then how come we preserved Western civilization for longer than the Greeks and the Romans? If we are so hating, if we so despise the West, how is it that we have carried this tradition for longer than any other single power in human history? Nonsense. You said on a stream that some of your Discord server show cult like behavior. Oh, yeah, that was um, yeah, that was uh, with um, Mauritian struggle and Renaissance man. Okay. Oh, nice. Read some Thomas Carlyle. Why would I bother? I've got better things to read. Like, this is one of the problems that I mentioned with AA's people when I streamed with Settlers Lament. Like, you're reading the wrong things. The reason why you keep failing is because you are focusing on the exterior political situation instead of focusing on your own virtue, instead of pursuing reality. You can despise leftism all you like, and you can have very long streams about how much you hate leftism, and how much you like Evola or Carlyle, but really that's not going to change anything. What you need to do is learn virtue and apply it. You need to go through the scriptures, go through Aristotle, his Nicomachean ethics is a good place, and learn how to live ordered life so that you can make change. There is no sense whatsoever in discussing anything else. And the great bonus of this is that if you fail in your political endeavours, you will still have virtue and you may even be saved. Okay. The two old platonic theory is utter nonsense. The natural world is great and complaining about suffering. I mean, this is what Evola says. <laughs> so you're taking issue with Evola. The, the natural world is indeed great. We have, we, we have ample proofs of this in the scriptures. God does not create anything that isn't good. And so, I've been responding to the chat for quite a while. Uh, if you guys want to like pile up questions in the chat, I'll get back to them. But I'm going to start responding to some of Evola's, Evola's uh, doctrines, which would be prima facie contrary to Christianity. That is, you know, of itself just contrary to Christianity right there and then. And also, I would say, kind of contrary to natural reason. Because this is originally, a lot of this is originally from an essay that I wrote on his natural philosophical errors. So, the first one is that he suggests that different classes ought to worship different gods, or different castes. This is trivial for a Christian to see as false, because there is a single god who all offer wor who you all worship offer bleh, sorry, who all offer worship to. Because these other gods, they are simply creatures. What would be the point in worshiping the the gods, these creatures, if you could worship the thing that created them? Not to mention the fact that these gods, insofar as they allow human beings to worship them, they are evil. Uh, they are corrupt because they are acting contrary to the nature of reality by allowing themselves to be worshipped. Because all worship is due by the virtue of natural justice to God. Even if you aren't Christian, there is a natural virtue of religion which is observed by other other religious groups such as Muslims and by Jews. Even that, And even, actually, you know, I won't get into that. Because that, that, I'm thinking of extraordinary cases where there may be um, there may be something more to it than that. However, even from a pagan position, this makes little sense as well. Because why should your blood actually change the worthiness of worship towards a particular god? And indeed, in in Evola's case, why would the nature of the soul, um, you know, that produces the flesh, why would this change the nature of a particular god of a particular god insofar as it's worshipped? If these can even be called gods at all. Because one of the strange things is that some of these gods are weak, or actually weakened by a lack of sacrifices. And in any case, they're ultimately limited to being limited beings. Which are subservient to ultimate reality, which is be that which is the Lord, which is the Lord God. And in Hin you know, actually I won't talk about that. <laughs> it's just the Lord. Uh, we'll call it the Lord. Pure being at Pure being, as Aquinas calls it, absolute being, as uh, Blessed John Duns Scotus calls it. The much nastier problem, and this is really something that is really latent in most people's thinking in the modern era. This isn't Evola, per se. This is the entire culture, the entire self-improvement community is a very 
good example of this is that of salvation. One of the things which Evola is often apt to repeat is that he thinks that the soul being immortal is a strange view. He holds that only heroes and such are immortal, and that the common man dies physically, and then his spirit undergoes a slow fading away, which he calls the second death. We mentioned this earlier on. Now, if man is spiritual, in the sense that his intellect and will are non-divisible and aren't composed of things, how can this be? That is, if they're one thing, if they're undividable, because all corruption is the breaking away of more composed things into their constituent parts. What we're saying when we say that intellect and will are non-divisible is to say that there are no parts in which to break it down. How can this be in this case? Something in this state either exists or it does not exist, because it's incorruptible. So Evola's basically stating that spiritual things are composed, and if this is going to be able to happen, if this is going to be able to happen, and therefore composed and thus in the world of becoming, which means there can't be a human nature per se in the realm of being. And he would say this as well, as far as I'm concerned. He has some very funny views on matter, which I'm not going to talk about here, but um, you know, it's probably worth having a look into if you particularly if you you know uh, Aristotle and the scholastics very well. However, the greater error, and this is what pertains to you, uh, because he's addressing these people he calls aristocrats of the soul here. The greater error is found in chapter 8 of Revolt, where he asserts that the patricians and aristocrats, when they die, begin to possess a self-subsistent and transcendent eternal life. Although, as we will discuss, I don't think he means this in an absolute sense. Incorruptibility, and they can attain this by their own action, by the way. This is the real problem, but we'll get onto that. Incorruptibility implies one of two things. Either that the aristocrat obl obliterates his ability to undergo de decay, despite his inherently corruptible nature, meaning composed, meaning that it breaks down in into constituent parts, or that there is some sort of vicarious action of something else which does have this on the aristocrat. So, for example, uh, human beings will be eternal after the resurrection of the dead because gr God grants them the ability to be. This, this would be an incorruptible being such as God, providing providing a corruptible nature with the ability to be eternal. As I have no particular issue with the latter case, I will deal with the former. How can it be that an aristocrat can change his own immutable nature? This would be akin to a cat, through its own effort, becoming a dog. So then how can a man become a not-man? Because that's what it is. He's destroying his own nature to do this, in theory. If man has inherently within himself to die two deaths, how can any act, short of some greater being recognising and granting incorruptibility on the basis of that action, remove this property? Through some sort of ritual that, that makes actual a potential that somehow obliterates the very nature of that potential. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm writing rhetorically here. So, through some sort of ritual that makes actual makes actual potential, that somehow obliterates the very nature with that potential. So, you know, Evola will talk about these rituals in which people are ennobled. And so he's basically saying that by virtue of these rituals, and doesn't, doesn't really point to any true one, that this makes man immortal somehow. And because there's no exterior greater force vicariously acting then it seems to me that the only way that this could happen is if man somehow broke down his own nature. This is sheer nonsense because it requires for a nature to be fully actual for it to destroy itself. Because, you know, human beings by their nature are composed. Additionally, what can this man's action add to himself that would make him immortal? If he is by his nature perishable, then how can he make himself imperishable? He cannot give what he does not have, therefore any act in itself will never ever increase his being. The potential to do this must be granted by something which is not him. Thirdly, each of these people are by nature perishable. For this to work in a qualified sense, they must have received their self-subsistent being from something else. So self-subsistence is impossible for them without this being. Granted, I don't think Evola actually believes this. I think he, he probably holds to some sort of ultimate reality which holds the aristocrats in being. Um, so they're not actually self-subsistent in the sense that they actually are their own act, but they are rather self-subsistent by virtue of something exterior to them. Therefore, they cannot be said to be self-subsistent as they are reliant on something else. Finally, although Evola doesn't mean this, self-subsistence can be read to mean self-subsistence independent of prior being. 
so I write this for the benefit of certain interpretations. The mere fact that there that these people can interact with the world shows that there is a unity to this world, which is evident through the ability for the aristocrat to interact with things beside himself. There is a unity of existence, not insofar as everything is the same thing and therefore everything is God, but insofar as they are provided being by the same act of creation. So they receive their existence from God and God holds them in existence by the same act, which is God moving from eternity to create the world. These things do not possess their existence, but rather are granted their existence by, from something else. Because if they didn't share a commonality in existence, they would be utterly imperceptible. If we didn't have commonality with the objects around us, say the book um, on my desk, or the picture, or the laptop, or the microphone, we wouldn't be able to perceive it, because there would be absolutely no commonality between us. Where was I in this? Therefore, for an aristocrat to be self-subsistent in this sense, he would need to entirely divorce himself from his own existence, which is granted by something else. Now, this is impossible because this would mean he would have to become not himself in any way, which means that it makes no sense to call him eternal, because it's not him. Likewise, if this were possible, this would mean that by virtue of being his own act of self-sufficiency, that he would be entirely cut off from everything else because of this difference. Because that self-subsistency would have to be different from everything else, including the origin which unifies all things, to make it distinct. There needs to be different acts of existence, and the act of existence needs to be completely different. It needs to be different in such a way as to distinguish it from the act of existence which brings the world into being. So, I mean, this, this, this is implausible. It, it can't happen in the sense that an aristocrat of the soul, when he dies, becomes a god that is reliant on nothing to provide his being or to sustain his existence. That is not the nature of human beings, and it's not the nature of anything besides God. It's impossible. And this isn't even me talking as a Christian. Uh, a Muslim would hold this, a Jew would hold this, Aristotle would hold it. Uh, you know, this is just natural reason. This is, this is simply the result of, um, you know, what we get from pure being. So I'm going to quickly check the chat, because we're going to talk about his ideas of spiritual forces and on demons in a second, and I have a feeling I've been going for quite a while. Okay. Uh, I brought here by AA. Okay. All good. This is definitely the biggest issue with Vola. What do you suggest we change in the world politically? Um, I suggest that you're not going to probably change it f for the best in your lifetime. I think that the best way to do it is to pick a party which makes sense, vote for them, insofar as you can spare time from other things which are more important, like your spiritual being. Sure, join parties. I'm in a political party myself. And move them in the correct direction, not just your opinion of what the best direction is. Like, actually seek knowledge on what makes sense in the reality at the moment. And... Beyond that, don't worry, because it is very likely that none of you will see a traditional world as you desire in this life. It just won't happen. And even when you do obtain it, you will be troubled by it, because people will still be fallible. You know, even in the Middle Ages, even, you know, in ancient Rome, there were still grave evils that were perpetuated on a societal scale. We're not going to ever avoid that, that's just the nature of the reality we live in. We can make it better. But we shouldn't stake our entire life on the success of political movements or on political theory of any form. We should be focusing on what matters, and that's the truth. What's the point of refuting Evola? Because he's very, very popular. Uh, academic agent. Hi, folks. I'm like 40 minutes behind, but I'm listening. Okay, cool. Uh, populist delusion. Just finished it. Cheers, Scaldi. Uh, da, 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 da. human beings are material. No, they're not. Because as um, there's a paper called The Immaterial Aspect of Man by... I've forgotten his name. Uh, James H James something. And there's another paper which corroborates this together by Edward Fazer, which is about the immaterial aspects of thought and an and a author called Saul, Saul Kripke. And he observes that... Um, okay, so here's how the argument goes, right? So, physical things are, by their nature, uh, ambiguous in their meaning. So, for example, um, you know, if I have a drawing of a triangle, that could signify many things. 
That could signify a band called Triangle. It could be a sign to stop on the road. It could be many different things. But the trouble is, is that our own thoughts, they are not ambiguous. We know what we're thinking. And therefore, because of that, non our, our minds are non-physical. Therefore, they're not composed, as we would hold anyway. They're at the very least non-physical. They're not composed. And therefore, they're eternal. There are other arguments for this as well from, uh, you know, the likes of Plotinus who will argue that thoughts um, in their nature are, are, in, are, are indivisible. So, like, you can see this with, uh, you know, sentences. Like, if you divide up a sentence, you don't have the same thought if you divide it up. Um, and he argues that because of this, the human mind is simple, as I just stated, and therefore it's imperishable. Uh, there are many, many arguments. So, yeah, this is just not true. What do you think about the recent drama surrounding Fuentes? I pay no attention to Fuentes. Um, would you rather fight a horse-sized duck or ten duck-sized horses? Uh, quack. That's my answer. Not saying that he is wrong about Evola, but it's unimportant when considering how the church has been completely co-opted by the present narrative. I don't think it has. I don't think it has at all. I think that there are aspects of the church that talk in this language. There are people within the church, but... I mean, there were people in Israel who sacrificed their babies to Molech, right? And also, we should be weary of uh, actually going into um, going into schism over being too based. Because, I mean, this is, this is something that's troubled me for quite a while. I think that being religious for the sake of being based is bloody ridiculous, right? If you just want to be so based, you know, that's not pursuing truth. That's pursuing being based. And we ought to pursue truth. Which is sometimes a distinction with being based. I'm sorry. <laughs> sometimes we have to hold to things that we dislike. Things that are not cool. Like we have to admit, you know, our addictions. We have to admit our failings. We have to admit our lack of knowledge of things. Our ignorance is a fact. You know, our sin is a fact. And these things are cringe. Um, but this knowledge, knowing this, is superior to just, you know, just pursuing the based. It's stated many times that human beings are material in Genesis. No, it isn't. No, it doesn't. It says in Genesis that uh, God took the took the the, um, the 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 sorry the soil of the earth and he spat on it, I think, and then he formed man and then he breathed the breath of life into him. Right? Note the breathing of the breath of life, which comes from God's mouth. This is the rational faculty, in my view, and you will not find. You will find almost no Christians affirming a material, a material soul or a material spirit. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Census will put us in spiritual bodies after the resurrection. Yeah, that's true. But there's also the particular judgment, which is where the non-physical aspects of hum the human person are damned, are you know judged. Right? There are currently, as we talk, saints who are in heaven. That have not been resurrected. And there are people in hell. You know I think even Jude says. Uh, that there are currently people. Oh, that was it. He says that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Are currently burning in fire. How can this be. If we are purely physical. Because when um, when the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Were obliterated with um, with God's fire. Which I think is at Tel Al-Haman. And it's, a, it's, a, it's actually some sort of comet. Right. These bodies. Like, they're completely decomposed. How can they be undergoing the eternal torments of hell if they are purely physical beings? This doesn't make sense. Okay, let's let's continue. On spiritual forces and the lack of personhood in demons. As well as misapprehending human salvation, he also makes mistakes in relation to spiritual entities as well. He asserts in chapter 7 of Revolt that in the ancient world, that the spirituality was originally nothing more than experience, and that the gods are more than, like forces than personal deities. He attributes this to the inner doctrine. Like he he believes that there were like folk beliefs where these these deities actually had personalities, but he believes that the inner doctrine is that these are forces. He makes a distinction between what the common people believed, which are the beings as personal, which are beings are personal, and those who have inner doctrine. I actually noted this. I didn't. It serves you right for a. Uh, Writing this a week ago and not going over it before the stream, eh? Which makes these into spiritual forces. So that's the that's the gods. He speaks of these as, quote, super rational and superhuman ways of being. So that is above. 
These are used for rituals. Evola speaks about these rituals in which there are changes in the soul, such as the consecration of a king, which is something akin to how we understand Catholic ordination, which um, where, you know, where I, this will also apply to baptism, right? You have uh, in, in the three, in these three sacraments, baptism, confirmation, and ordination, you have an indelible mark left on the soul. It changes the nature of a human person. Okay. He, so he would he could also be saying this in the sense of actualizing the potential already in the spirit. We, in fact, he actually does in relation to Arya. So he speaks about noble people being born without this um, this ordination, this um, not ordination, like this uh, sort of what's the word? It's like a consecration almost. Yeah. And he will speak about these people before their their consecration as being inferior to the lowest caste, which are the Shudra. Um, but after this, they're, they're fully actual. So there's like a latent potency in the soul of uh, certain castes. He states that this is nothing more than the priest manipulating various forces to achieve a particular effect in combination with the spiritual state. Or at least it would seem to be if the inner doctrines are true. Which I, I think, considering Evola's background on esotericism, I, I suspect he believes that. So I'm going to respond to it as if he is. This raises a man to a higher state based on the forces actualizing the potential to be something like a king, which was already present in his nature. This, however, raises a problem for Evola. If he claims that the gods are higher levels of being than man, super rational, that specifically, then why do they not possess personhood, intellect, and will? These things being the non-physical aspects of mankind, which are the higher parts of their being because they don't decay. You know, I will always be Elliot. You will always be AA. You will always, you know, the person watching this, AA, you know, you will always be your particular person regardless of whether someone hacks your arm off or not. You know, you will always have an intellect and a will regardless of how your body decays because these things are simple and therefore they are the highest level of being because they can't decay. They need not possess per personhood in a human manner, but it would be strange if forces higher than humans did not possess something resembling our highest faculties, our intellect and will. Now, if Vola insists that these higher entities must be dumb forces to be manipulated by a priest, then how can they be higher than us? Every manipulator must be greater than the one he manipulates in some quality. For example, a man can have power over a stupider man through his cleverness, or over a weaker man through his physical strength. It would then follow that the forces must be lower than the priest. In that case, in what sense are these forces super-rational and supernatural? Is the priest something other than human? Or are these forces not, in fact, superior to us? Now, on top of this fact, there is the reality that these sorts of occultists have a funny habit of becoming possessed. You see, you in the secular world who are watching this, we have, we have a lot of information about exorcisms. We've been doing them for thousands of years. Roman Catholic priests such as Father Ripperger, who, by the way, is an extremely qualified man. He has, I think he's got, he's got at least one PhD. If, if not more, right? He's not, he's not a silly man, and you can watch his lectures on YouTube. He even speaks to these sorts of demons. They respond. If these demons are impersonal, then how is it that they are able to speak? Does this not pertain to things with an intellect and will, and hence some sort of personhood unifying the creature? So how can they be dumb forces? They, they, I don't think they can be. I think that there may be some sorts of... Um, you know, I'm, I'm undecided on whether there could be certain impersonal forces, but I, I kind of tend to say no, because as I've stated, if they're super rational, and to be honest, I think indiv indivisible things are greater than, than, than divisible things. So I, I suspect, I suspect they would. Um, hmm. I think that there's, there's variant opinions among Catholics. I know that Jimmy Aiken did a podcast on this. I'm not sure, but I know for a fact that there are millions upon millions of demons. This is just the fact. So, in conclusion, and I'm just going to turn this into a question and answer stream after this, because I know there are a lot of you guys, and I'm sure you guys have got a lot of questions. As we can, and I'm going to re, I'm going to go through um, Grammarly and uh, correct this uh, script, because I typed this out frantically in about six hours, and it's really showing. As we can see from this overview of Evola's spiritual doctrine and his antipathy, antipathy but towards Christianity, we can see that Evola neither understood Christianity nor Judaism. Despite some references to the fathers here and there, and even pagan polemicists whose works are found exclusively in Christian responses, he has manifestly failed to apprehend the faith. 
We have we have also professed to speak of some some of Evola's own doctrines, in which I haven't mentioned all of them that I might take issue with. For example, his doctrine of spiritual race, because I don't sufficiently understand it. I know he wrote three books on this, and I haven't read them. As this is a, intended to spark a dialogue between Christians and pagans and secular types who are interested in this, or hermeticists, or whatever you want to call yourselves, this, I think, is a good start. And so, I, I will leave it at that, and I will leave the floor open to people who want to talk. Okay. John 313 says that no one has ascended into heaven besides God. Well, I mean, let me grab my Bible and see precisely what it says. Oh yeah, by the way, you're wrong. Uh, because, as you see in the... Um, I mean, you see in one of, of St. Um, St. Peter's epistles that that Jesus goes down to the dead to preach the, the kingdom to them. And you see in... Um, you see in the book of Revelation discussions of the numerous, the numberless saints before the Lamb. So let's see, John three one three. Okay. Nicodemus answered him, and Jesus answered, said, "Are you teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak that which we know." And bear witness to that which we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, it's evident that Jesus doesn't mean this this idea of um, you know being received into heaven because Elijah and Enoch in the Old Testament are received into heaven like this. So he must mean something else. It could, in fact, actually the the notes on my study Bible seem to be indicating it's about his origin. So you know we can we can private interpretation ourselves to death, but the fact of the matter is, as I stated earlier on, is that. There is a supremacy to Peter in the scripture and he establishes a magisterium and teaches based on the divine scriptures and on divine tradition. And from this we can know that there are saints currently in heaven, although they have not been resurrected yet. Watch Caesar's Messiah, how censored is an allegory for Titus' war against Israel. Okay, so if, if the Messiah is like an allegory for um, Titus' war against Israel, then how come the Messiah is mentioned like 700 years beforehand. Nonsense. In fact, in some sense, in fact, I cited the Book of Numbers, which was written somewhere between 1,400 and 1,200 years before. So this can't be the case. Uh, being based is ultimately an anti-establishment aesthetic. Heterodox iconography, yikes. Uh, watch my stream uh, responding to Father Seraphim Rose on, um, on St. Francis of Assisi. He's based. He, I mean, he's not based in the sense I just described. He's cool. Like, he is not. He is not the character that um, that Seraphim Rose portrays him as by any means. I, I think that uh, I suspect this is because Seraphim Rose didn't read uh, Bonaventure's biography of him. Romans six two three as can be paraphrased as the wages of sins is death, eternal life, not eternal life. Hell, uh, yeah. Yeah, eternal hell, sure. Second Kings chapter three: How a pagan, a pagan god defeated Yahweh. No, he didn't. What what it said is that this is about Mesha, isn't it? This is about King Mesha of Moab. Um, yeah, he drove away the um, the suzerainty of Israel, but Israel had broken away from God at this point. Like you had the whole schism between uh, Jeroboam, so and they worshipped the uh, the calves at Dan and Bethel. Um, so yeah, this isn't. And even so, like we, we can lose physical battles. This doesn't mean that Yahweh has been prevailed over by Chemosh. This just means that Yahweh has, has permitted his people to lose. As we see throughout history, and of course this is for the good. Because sometimes you need to be defeated in order to be humbled. Because God desires us to be virtuous. And if we won all the time, we would simply be prideful. But the, pride, the prideful shall be torn down. If God wants us to be profitable, we have to lose sometimes. So it's contrary to his purposes to let us always win. How could we be humble if we always won? 
Uh, left off book, 100 Years of Modernism with more for this. Okay. Of course, anyone who criticizes Christianity doesn't understand it. it. looks like no one seems to understand it. No, plenty of people have understood it. Evola just doesn't. You've, I've got the whole stream here for this. Um, so, yeah. It, it's not me, like, coping or something. Like, it, like we have plenty of, of writing on this. It's just if people like Evola can't be bothered to read it or present it in that way in his book, then that's, you know, his problem. Do you like the Settlers' Lament style of ecumenism? Uh, <laughs> what, the, the um, baptize, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? Yeah, I, I don't mind that. It means that no one has gone off traveling in of themselves. They're not ignorant of figures of Elijah law. Uh, okay. The children of the seed of the woman came from heaven as opposed to the seed of the serpent. Tony Charles, pagans were thoroughly defeated by Christianity. Yeah, actually, Evola will tell you not to resurrect paganism. Like, you guys are participating in inventing traditions which don't... Yeah, I mean, how can you have a tradition, something that is handed down, right? If you're inventing it. You're just making a cult. Like, by resurrecting, you know, modern paganism, you're not resurrecting the, the faith of your ancestors. That was utterly obliterated. You know, it was in his death knells as Muhammad was being born. Why? Like, so you're actually creating your own faith based on... Based on writings that you have found, it's it's like a kind of a, you know, it's this whole private interpretation. Don't do it. It's not it's not authentic tradition. Right. I do not pray for the world, but for those you sent into the world. Da, 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 da. The only reason we know about the pagan deities is the Christian Shrubum. Yeah, but I don't think that's a very good argument. Um, let's see. I am thankful that original paganism is a large extent. Uh, Sue King's... Okay, blah, blah, blah. Elijah was taken up into another heaven. Everyone living must die. Yeah, everyone living must die. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Eli they say, actually, some of the... I think it's St. Robert Bellarmine says that Elijah and Enoch will be martyred by the Antichrist. So, yeah, even Elijah and Enoch must die. Yeah, I agree. But they've been taken up to heaven nonetheless. They're just not, like, dead. But the saints that are currently in heaven are living, you know? Uh, recalling what Christ says about... Um, about God being living when he's speaking to the Sadducees. You know, he says he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? If Isaac, um, Abraham, and Jacob are not alive, then, and this is when he's speaking to Moses, then how can it be that their non-physical um, attributes have not persisted after death? And wasn't that falsify the words of Christ? If we were to say, no, no, Jesus, you were mistaken. Um, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're not alive. Um, you know, your entire argument against the Sadducees was, you know, completely in vain. Alright, so, for those who are still here, um, if you guys want to watch the original video I made to AA and uh, Sargon, uh, I made... I'll actually post that in the description so you fellas can access it, because that was an initial shot across the bowels. This one is something that's been more read, although, you know, as I have said, the... Uh, <laughs> I should probably have given a bit more uh, more study to, uh, you know, like grammar and such. But, you know, eh. I'll, I'll correct and put it back up. Okay. So, ah, here we go. Why Christianity is heroic. Responding to academic Asian and Sargon. Okay. Yeah, Jesus is risen because he's the Messiah. I agree. Yeah. Uh, but we will all be risen at the resurrection of the dead. Right, I'm going to check other social media. I'm going to see if anybody has said anything elsewhere. Because, I mean, if... Uh... Actually, no, I think uh, that um, AA grabbed it from somewhere else. Okay. Let's check Discord. Has anyone messaged me? Yay. Okay. Announcements. Alright, fellas. If that's all there is... I will uh, bring it to do. Okay, do they really though? The, the, the universality of Christianity is exactly what drives anti-racism. Like, why do you guys keep thinking in 19th century terms with a religion that has existed for 2,000 years? I, I, I don't get it. Like, there, there were Christians before the French Revolution. Like, racism didn't even exist in the mouth of Jesus when he was in his human form. He, he, he wouldn't... He would have known what it meant by virtue of his divine nature, because the divine nature is outside of time, but it wasn't something that was talked about. Right? I mean, maybe there were, there were ethnic issues. In fact, I know there were ethnic issues. 
uh, in those times. But, like, contemporary political ideology is not the gospel. The gospel goes back 2,000 years. And there were writers in all of those centuries explaining it. Why view it in such temporal terms? Hopefully your blood is full of oxygen and not tradition. <laughs> Modern paganism is just political association. Because the progressive nature of Latinism... Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, so, um, actually... I'll leave the Eastern Orthodox for another stream. Uh, because... I mean, I've talked about Seraphim Rose before on this channel. Like, I, I had a period where I was tempted towards Eastern Orthodoxy. Like, I'm a convert, for those who don't know. Uh, not from Eastern Orthodoxy, from Atheism. Um, but, yeah, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, in my view, doesn't really stand the historical test in any in any way at all. And, you know, you're talking about, like, the progressive nature of Latinism. Um, like, look at your own theologians. <laughs> you're going to find crazy stuff in those. I'm telling you, mate. You, you think that we have problems? You have no idea. <laughs> What microphone uh, do you use? I love the crystal clear sound. It's a very old um, blue snowball, but it doesn't have the switch on the end. I can't remember the exact name of it. And it also helps them very loud. <laughs> uh, Christianity is reaching its final form, betraying its people. Yeah, 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 Tony Charles. Yeah, the, the final form that it took 2,000 years to develop. Come on, man. Right? Like, um, are we going to... Like, you know, I could make the same argument with right-wingism. Like, you know, the right-wing, it was invented by the French Revolution. It's reaching its final form in leftism. Like, why why don't I say that? If we're going to say things that, that don't follow? Because, you know, if Christianity as a spiritual doctrine is aimed at making a life holy and making the church holy, sure, we will have developments. But I think that we've proven that leftism is contrary to to Christianity. The mere fact that the popes so vigorously opposed the French Revolution and liberalism is evidence of this. So, yeah. Okay. Please do a video on orthodoxy, unquote. Um, I might do. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's um, enough questions. We've been going for an hour and a half. Uh, I'm going to go eat. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, take care. And uh, God love you. Bye-bye.